Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this second session in the new online learning series on humanitarian law and policy produced by PHAP, short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. My name is Anherid Lang. I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, and I will be helping uh, towards the second half of the event today in moderating the Q&A. Uh, but to get us started, I'm going to pass the floor to my colleague Elizabeth Holland, who's a consulting expert on international humanitarian law and also serving as host of this online learning series on humanitarian law and policy. Before I pass the floor, though, I just have to say it's really terrific to see so many members of the association as well as guests uh, here with us um, in the virtual room today. And I also saw from the uh, the SNAP poll uh, regarding uh, people's previous experience, exposure, and the familiarity uh, with the topic of today's session. Uh, it looks like it's um, uh, very, uh, very appropriate and very good audience uh, for, for what we have to offer today. So I'm very excited to see all of you here. Uh, so with that, I will pass the floor over to you, Elizabeth. Wonderful. Thank you very much, on Herod. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. It's great to see, I see some familiar faces from our previous session in the chat, so welcome. And an equally warm welcome to those of you who may be joining us for the first time. <clears throat> Today we'll be talking about, in our second session of this series, the four core humanitarian principles, humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence. So <clears throat> before we jump into the substance, um, I'd like to just take care of one or two quick uh, housekeeping items. And the first is um, a very enthusiastic encouragement um, for those of you with us to submit a question. And this question, um, what we'll try to do is, is pose these questions in the second half of this, uh, this event. And so there's a box to the right of your screen, and we'd invite you at any point during today's event to submit questions there. Um, that's better and preferable than the chat, because as you might see, it would be quickly lost in the chat. So we'd encourage you, if you have any questions uh, beginning from this moment, to please uh, put those into the, the appropriate box to the right of your screen. Um, similarly, um, in terms of administrative, Elements, if you do encounter any technical difficulties, any glitches um, with today's event, there is a backup stream that's available on YouTube at the URL on your screen right now. And I would caution you that this is truly, though, a backup option because the interactivity is not available uh, on, on this, on, on this uh, backup. So we'd encourage you to stay here with us on this platform. But if you do encounter any problems, uh, you can certainly access the event event through this backup option. So without any further ado, we will jump right in. <clears throat> so to begin with um, today, I'd like to review uh, briefly the session learning objectives. And this helps lay, of course, the, the groundwork for what we hope to accomplish over the next hour. But it's also um, an effort on our part to ensure that, that we're accountable to you, the audience, um, in terms of what we plan to cover. And then also, for those of you who are PHAP members, we make available the option to take an assessment after this event. And that assessment is a really worthwhile um, exercise in evaluating the information and the knowledge uh, gained during this session. So we'd encourage those PHAP members interested to take uh, advantage of this opportunity. We'll provide you the assessment code at the end of the event. But in, in any case, the session learning objectives will help guide our discussion over the next 60 minutes. So to begin with, um, the first objective, of course, is understanding what we mean by the four core principles. When we talk about humanity, impartiality, neutrality, and independence, what do, what do we mean from a definitional standpoint? Um, from a legal, from an operational standpoint, how are these principles, what do people mean when they reference these principles? Um, similarly, we'd hope to, um, you know, in brief, because we only have an hour together, so I guess all of this comes with the caveat that it is a relatively brief discussion, um, which we will be picking up and doing dives. Um, as we um, as we host uh, additional sessions in this series over the coming weeks and months. 
So our second se our second learning objective is is to create an awareness of the other operating principles that may be gu uh, humanitarian organizations. So we will be focusing on the core four, but the core four the core four are not by any means the only principles um, that are important to operations. We'll also hope to foster an understanding of the relationship between these principles and international humanitarian law, or IHL. And IHL is that legal work that regulates the use of force during armed conflict. We'll also look to discuss um, sort of what does assistance and access mean under IHL. So in terms of this, this legal framework, um, having this, the terms, the definitions, um, the scope of these very important ideas, um, we'll, we'll look to see what IHL says about access and assistance. And then in closing, we're going to, to introduce um, some, though not all, but some contemporary dilemmas and debates um, about how these principles are operationalized. So, I hope here that what, what we'll be able to do is get a sense of the landscape in terms of the humanitarian principles and, the, and how to operationalize them. To ensure that we all have a shared understanding of terminology and vocabulary, and that we understand what the benefits are in terms of both adopting the principles but also abiding by the principles. Because it's one thing, of course, to pay lip service to the principles, and it's an entirely um, different exercise to meaningfully adopt, implement, operationalize, and ensure the continued respect for these principles. And here I'd flag for you two general important conceptions before we move on. And that's that we are, in fact, talking about principles and not legal rules um, in the strict technical sense. So when we talk about legal rules, for instance, those that we find in IHL, we talk about, for the most part, rules that have very clear um, actors who have obligations and those who have rights um, pursuant to these rules. They're usually enforceable um, in terms of various legal, uh, in terms of various legal tools and, and mechanisms. But the principles are different insofar as they're not necessarily, um, of course, legally enforceable, but that's not to say that they are in any way less important. I think there are plenty who would probably argue that in many situations they're perhaps of more operational relevance than legal rules. So let's, we just want to be clear that we're talking about principles and not rules, and that really the, the true, um, the true strength, the true significance of the principles is, is how they, they impact behavior. Um, because we're talking about them in the context of humanitarian assistance, humanitarian operations, and so their, their real force is whether or not they facilitate humanitarian assistance um, and whether or not they impact um, the behavior of all the various actors in such a way is that humanitarian access is, is facilitated and possible. So with that, we will talk about what the four core principles are. And what you have on your screen is the language from two uh, United Nations General Assembly resolutions. And now, this is not, of course, the first time that the principles um, were, were affirmed or mentioned, but we have it on the screen because it, it does represent not only a commitment by states to these principles, of course, because they're General Assembly resolutions, but they are also important because they are here mentioned as those principles that should undergird the humanitarian enterprise. So we have first mentioned in 1991 of humanity, neutrality, and impartiality. And then a few years later in 2004, we have the addition of independence. So you often see these General Assembly resolutions cited as an affirmation of the principles. But of course, you find the principles in other places. Uh, namely, many also reference the seven fundamental principles of the Red Cross. Uh, these are found in the statues of the International Red Cross and Red Crescent movements. These date back to the mid-1960s. And in addition to the four, the seven fundamental principles of the Red Cross also have voluntary service, unity, and universality. So these principles are important from not only the operational and policy standpoint, but also in terms of um, establishing a shared vocabulary and a shared terminology. So what we will do later is look at the actual definitions of the principles.
But what's important to recall at this point as well is the principles are important not only um, sort of in and of themselves, but because they're also, of course, critical to access. Access um, requires not only, of course, the consent of the parties, but, but once you have access, it's important to be able to maintain this access. So these principles are important in terms of that, um, the language and the engagement that's necessary for access. Now, though we will be talking about the four principles, I'd like to hear, of course, that there are quite a few others. Um, and so in terms of operating principles, various professional standards that exist in the sector, um, there, are, there, are different, um, there are different formulations and different conceptions, um, many quite complementary. And most, if not all, of course, reference the four core. But in addition to the four core, you have notions of universality, of transparency, of accountability, professionalism, the notion of do no harm. So what you see on your screen are other examples of additional principles that we'll have the opportunity, both within this series, but in other events that PHAP offers, to discuss these at great, in greater length. Here, I'd like to link immediately um, the principles to practice. And so what I've done is I've selected just a few, um, a few examples of references, of explicit references to the principles by different organizations. And so here you have the mission part of the mission statement of OCHA. Now, in this statement, you'll see that they don't reference, they don't spell out the principles. They just simply say principled humanitarian action. It's likely safe to assume that this includes the four core, but it's interesting to note that, for instance, in the mission statement, we don't see the articulation of the four core. Um, in comparison, here we have the principles of MSF, and so on the MSF website, you see that MSF states explicitly um, their commitment to independence and impartiality. And so interesting, what you don't see is reference to neutrality, and here we'll talk We'll talk a bit later on in this in this event about why uh, some organizations may uh, decide not to adopt neutrality as a core operating principle. And here you have the mission statement of the ICRC, uh, which mentions all four very explicitly: impartiality, neutrality, independence, and humanity. And then lastly, you have the NGO um, Action Against Hunger, which provides its international charter online. And here you see independence, neutrality, and non-discrimination. And if you read the definition or the description of non-discrimination provided by Action Against Hunger, you see that it is in fact very similar to that which you'll see as the definition of impartiality. So this reminds us um, of the helpful the helpful lesson that we say humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence very often, but there are other terms that uh, may be used by various actors that have very similar meanings and in practice may be synonymous or close to synonymous. In addition to the, the sort of the mission statements, the charters, um, the, the, the operating principles and the policies, you'll also find reference to these principles in grant agreements. And here's a very interesting excerpt from a grant agreement. Um, the agreement itself will remain anonymous. Um, but this was a grant agreement for significant funds from one NGO to another. So in other words, similar to a subcontract. And this contract has as one of its clauses um, the requirement that the partner NGO will act in all times at all times in accordance with the humanitarian principles. So it's interesting here to see the principles referenced in the contractual setting. Um, and so in terms of the obligations on, the, on an NGO being not only those that the NGO would presumably ascribe to as part of its own decision making, but also that they are then bound by the terms of its contract, um, interestingly enough, uh, to abide by these principles. So moving on um, from, these, from this brief set of examples, I'd like also to make note um, of the importance of the formulations of humanitarian action. Because of course what we're talking about, the, print, the relevance of the principles are all in the context of humanitarian operations. <clears throat> and even humanitarian action, as we'll see, um, that also has slightly different conceptions, uh, slightly different definitions, and the variations 
and may in fact be of consequence uh, to some organizations. So we are focusing here uh, in this session generally on situations of armed conflict. Thus, that's why we're talking also about the link between the principles and IHL. But humanitarian action, of course, may be conceived of as more broadly, as more, uh, more broadly because Humanitarian operations also take place, of course, in situations of natural disasters, um, in highly unstable situations that may not uh, amount to a non-international armed conflict or an international armed conflict such that IHL applies. So there are other, or there are other contexts in which humanitarian organizations uh, may be operating and which the principles, of course, may, may guide and, and influence those operations, but what we're doing here is talking generally about humanitarian operations in situations of armed conflict. So there's different formulations of, it, of humanitarian action. You see here this very broad one. This is included in the principles of good humanitarian donorship. And it's interesting, and I include it here, because of course the principles of good humanitarian donorship have been agreed to by many states, including um, very significant donor states. So it's interesting to see here that this very broad conception of humanitarian action is what states, um, the, the states who have, who have signed on to the, the good humanitarian donorship principles, what they conceived of as, as um, amounting to humanitarian action. And in other formulations, of course, you'll see reference to the importance of access, the importance of gaining access, of facilitating access, and of sustaining access. You'll also see reference to assistance, relief, and protection activities as falling under the umbrella of humanitarian action. And you will generally also see reference to the idea that this is needs-based, that it is an emergency response, and that it's a needs-based response. So that being said, it's important to understand when you're speaking with various actors, um, partner organizations, the UN, ICRC, states, uh, the, local ben the local population, um, the beneficiary population, um, local partners, etc., that there may be slightly different conceptions of what exactly it is that fits under the umbrella of humanitarian assistance. An important dividing line, however, is to determine what is development, versus what is a humanitarian assistance. And though that line may be gray um, on either side, generally speaking, it's important to maintain the delineation between the two types of activity. And of course, here we're talking about humanitarian assistance. So having now sort of set the the landscape um, about the relevance of the principles, where we might find reference to the principles, um, and where the principles fit in in terms of the larger uh, landscape of humanitarian assistance. We'll now turn to the actual principles, and we'll begin with humanity. Humanity is essentially the motivation. It's the motivation for the action. And it reminds us that, of course, each individual is endowed with an inherent dignity. And it's, it's on the basis that each individual has a value, an inherent value, um, that there is this motivation, this normative sense of an obligation to provide assistance to those in need. So humanity is really that motivating principle. It's not so much the means through which the assistance is delivered, but it's the reason why the assistance is delivered. And you find reference to humanity in IHL. Moving on, the second principle is that of impartiality. And there are essentially three elements of this idea of impartiality. And you see here non-discrimination, proportionality, and no subjective distinctions. And so what that means is impartiality requires that assistance be delivered only based on need. So that, necessi that necessitates, of course, a needs assessment. And once there has been an understanding of the needs of the beneficiary population, then that, that assistance must be delivered only on that basis, only on the basis of needs. Um, and so when you're delivering 
that assistance, there can be no discrimination based on anything other than the need of, of, of the individual. So you cannot say, well, we are going to first focus on this set subgroup based on perhaps their religious affiliation, um, their nationality, um, their race. Um, it really must only be based on need. <clears throat> and then similar to the non-discrimination of proportionality, there's this idea that there cannot be a determination based on the provide that the provider has. Um, there can be no determination on the whether or not those that they are serving are deserving. So there's no subjective determination as to whether or not there's, for instance, guilt or innocence, um, deserving or undeserving of the assistance, because, of course, you are only delivering assistance to those in need. Those types of determinations are better um, left to those who are undertaking it in the legal context. So in addition to impartiality and humanity, we have independence. Now, at times, there could be a, some interplay between impartiality, neutrality, and independence. Those three um, sort of at the borders, um, there may be some overlap when you look into how they're operationalized. And so because of this, it's important to conceptually try to keep them as clear as possible. So impartiality is the delivery of assistance based on need. Independence is the autonomy of an organization from the political, economic, or military objectives of another actor. And this often comes into play when one talks about the relationship between the organization and a donor. And very often here we're talking about states. And so independence, really, when you talk about what does this mean in practice, means that the donors' political, military, or economic objectives are not reflected and are not guiding the operational and policy decisions of the humanitarian organization that may be receiving funds from that donor. So in other words, it's important for the humanitarian organization to be able to, at all times, make its own decisions guided by its own policies and its own decision-making processes when it comes to assistance and that it is not, there is, there's no sway, um, there's no decision-making being made based on donors. And then lastly, here is the definition of neutrality. Now, neutrality, um, much like independence, is not found explicitly referenced in IHL, but it is presumed to be necessary um, in order to act impartially. So the, there are very clear linkages um, with all of these principles. And so neutrality says that organizations must refrain from taking sides, from taking sides in the conflict. Now, of course, this is of particular relevance in situations of armed conflict where you have two clear sides, where you have belligerence um, on on two or more sides. As we see in current, in, in current conflicts, there are certainly more than, than two um, clear belligerents looking at Syria, for example. So neutrality requires that humanitarian organizations um, not take sides, not align themselves with one side or the other. Now, of course, the principle of neutrality <clears throat> perhaps is far easier to abide by in, for instance, situations of uh, natural disaster where you don't have uh, two or more parties at odds, or at least not in the conflict situation. Um, and so you have here ideological neutrality and military neutrality. Now, of course, military neutrality seems quite obvious, and that's that the NGO or the humanitarian organization cannot engage in hostilities. There's no direct or indirect engagement allowed. And the ideological neutrality means that there can't be an engagement, um, and that's less of a physical engagement. That's, of course, more of a, um, of a policy or a political engagement um, with, with the various uh, controversies that might be going on. <clears throat> 
So here's sort of a, a very easy um, breakdown, very brief, very quick, but it helps, and, and like I said before, it helps perhaps keep these conceptually different because in practice, um, the, opera, uh, the operationalization of these um, can be rather tricky. So we have, just to quickly review, humanity is the motivation for providing the assistance, and it's of course centered in this in this notion that there's an inherent dignity in each person. Um, impartiality is the requirement that the assistance be provided based on need and need alone. Independence is the requirement that the humanitarian organization retain autonomy from other actors, goals, or motivations. And that neutrality, of course, requires that humanitarian organization refrain from taking sides, both directly and indirectly, and both physically and otherwise, in the conflict. And here we're going to speak quickly about the relevance of IHL. And now why are we spending a few minutes looking to IHL? That's because IHL provides us with very helpful terminology, very helpful vocabulary, and because IHL helpfully carves out a space for humanitarian action. And so though IHL doesn't bind humanitarian organizations, IHL binds states and armed groups, as we discussed in our previous session. It does address humanitarian organizations, and it provides a space to undertake these operations. So we're going to look very quickly at what IHL says. Now, it's, it's important to recall before we jump into discussing IHL that under international law, more generally, so not just IHL, but under international law, the primary obligation for the well-being of the civilian population lies with the state. And so humanitarian organizations that come in to provide assistance provide assistance that is, in theory, complementary and auxiliary to that of the state. So we have here the definition of humanitarian assistance. So IHL provides a very narrow, narrow definition of humanitarian assistance. So we saw earlier that conceptions of humanitarian aid and assistance can be quite broad. But what IHL does is provide a very narrow definition. And that's essentially those things that are life-saving and life-sustaining activities. And what I've put on the slide here are examples of the various ways IHL has identified and articulated what humanitarian assistance is. And so you'll see here that because it's narrow, it's important to recall that when you're engaging with and when you're engaging in negotiations with states, especially states, but states or non-state armed groups, to recall that under IHL it's a very narrow um, it's a very narrow definition. That's not to say that you may not be able to argue for a broader consent and it may in fact be advantageous to do so, but it's important to know what IHL does say about assistance. Equally, it's important to know that under IHL there's no categorical right to humanitarian assistance, to humanitarian access. So humanitarian access, of course, is a prerequisite to the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And IHL does say that if there's a demonstrable need on the part of the civilian population, and the state is not able to address that, that the state is under an obligation to allow access to a humanitarian and impartial organization, but that access is still subject to the consent of the state. So you have, on the one hand, this requirement that there be the consent of the state, and this heralds, of course, back to notions of state sovereignty, but the state, on the flip side, is required to not withhold consent for arbitrary or capricious reasons. So that is essentially means that if there's a need on the part of the civilian population, the state is unable or unwilling to address that need. And there's an organization that is humanitarian and impartial. It will um, operate neutrally and independent, that they should, the state should, in fact, allow grant access to this organization and then facilitate the activities of this organization so long as there are no legitimate reasons such as uh, military or security concerns that perhaps the organization would uh, you know, further the military aims of its adversary. As long as there aren't legitimate concerns or reasons, then the state should provide consent. Similarly, IHL provides for the right of initiative. As I said before, IHL um, carves out some space 
And so what IHL says is these NGOs, these, these humanitarian organizations may offer their services to the parties to the conflict. And this means because it's parties and not high contracting parties, parties to the conflict mean that they're, that humanitarian organizations may offer their services to both state and non-state armed groups who are parties to the conflict. And these offer of services cannot be seen as unlawful interference in the sovereign affairs of the state. And so IHL provides, and in fact, um, ensures that there's a, a space for humanitarian organizations to offer their assistance. Now, this offer, these offers need not necessarily be accepted, but it's important to note that there is the space to make them. <clears throat> These are all, um, humanitarian access in particular, um, can be rather technical um, in terms of the legal rules and regulations surrounding that. So this, this is something that we will pick up um, in great detail in, in later sessions in this series. And I think we'll close out this part, um, this part of the event by just raising and introducing a few dilemmas, a few challenges, um, where we see the principles um, the principles in practice, in reality, um, coming up against some, some pretty significant hurdles. And one would be funding. And this is when um, organizations are funded um, in large part, but of course not exclusively, by states. And so what does it mean when a state purports to provide funding, but this funding is tied to um, it dictates regarding what crises uh, the organization may be able to work in, what areas, what territory of a, of a state an organization may be able to work in. And so there's implications for both independence and impartiality um, when there are various um, requirements, operational requirements tied to funding. So there is an acknowledgement of this, um, and you see this, this is a very important discussion that's ongoing. So despite the acknowledgement of this in, in, in many studies and in many documents, um, the challenge remains that there is funding um, very often offered that, have, um, that, that sort of have requirements to it. Similarly, there's this idea about neutrality and denunciation. And does neutrality require silence in the face of widespread violations? And some organizations will say that because we are neutral, we're unable to make public statements about violations, while others are of the mind that neutrality does not require silence um, and does not even require an even-handed approach to denouncing violations, but rather that acknowledging violations is simply a fact-based exercise in which an organization identifies um, violations that are factually demonstrable and um, and said that this is not a violation of neutrality. So neutrality and denunciation or speaking out about violations is a is also an ongoing debate. And we also of course have um, the questions about whether or not the use of armed escorts is even a an option for humanitarian organizations that want to ensure their operations are in accordance with these principles. Similarly, there is the instrumentalization of humanitarian organizations by other actors. And of course, the impact of counterterrorism regulations and policies on impartiality. Now, these and many other dilemmas will be, will be addressed in, um, in further sessions. And what's important to remember here, I think, is that when we talk about the, the principles, we talk about their importance to behavior and not only the importance that organizations adopt and abide by them and that they're, of course, um, ingrained in trainings and in policies and in standards and in security management, but that also the organizations are viewed as, are seen as, are perceived as acting in accordance with these principles. And when it comes to the safety and security of humanitarian organizations, staff, and operations, and most importantly, the safety and security of the beneficiary population that the organizations are aiming to assist, these, principle, these principles are, if, are of very great importance. Um, because 
in operating in accordance with these principles, humanitarian organizations are demonstrating that they are there to serve only the beneficiary populations, and they are not involved in any way in the armed conflict, um, or they are not related to the parties to the armed conflict. So these principles are incredibly consequential, not only to the operations of humanitarian organizations, but to those that they are seeking to assist. And I think with that, um, I will turn the floor over to Unherit, because I see that we have quite a few very interesting questions um, coming in from the participants. It was a very dynamic and engaging discussion. Um, I would remind those PHAT members who are interested um, that the assessment code for um, the evaluation will be online shortly. And I wish you all a very pleasant uh, morning, afternoon, and evening, and hope to see you online again soon. This is Beth Holland signing off.